pour l'entourer de Debra Kamboulé versus uh, Tanzania. Merci, M. le Président. Um, the matter of Debra Kamboulé versus the United Republic of Tanzania, application number 018-2018, will now be delivered. The court is composed of Sivia Ore, President, Ben Kiyoko, Vice President, Rafa Ben Ashu, Angelo V. Matuse, Susan Menge, M. Teresa Mukamolisa, Tujan Aro Chizomila, Chafika Ben Saula, Blaise Shikaya, and Stella I. Anukam judges and Robert Eno Registrar. In accordance with Article 22 of the Protocol to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, on the establishment of an African Court on Human and People's Rights, herein after referred to as the Protocol, and Rule 82 of the Rules of Court, herein after referred to as the Rules. Justice Imani A. Ab D. Abud, member of the court and a national of Tanzania, did not hear the application. Representation. Jebra Kamboli is self-represented, and the United Republic of Tanzania is represented by Dr. Clem Clement J. Mashamba, Solicitor General, Office of the Solicitor General. With him are seven others, all officers of the Attorney General's Chambers and the Legal Unit of Foreign Affairs and East African Corporation. After deliberation, the court renders the following judgment. The parties, Jebra Kamboli, hearing after referred to as the applicant, is a national of the United Republic of Tanzania. He is an advocate by profession and a member of the Tangayinka Law Society. He brings this application challenging Article 41 sub 7 of the Constitution of the Respondent State. The application is filed against the United Republic of Tanzania, herein after referred to as the Respondent State which became a party to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, hereinafter and after referred to as the Charter, on the 21st of October, 1986, and the Protocol on the 10th of February, 2006. It deposited on the 29th of March, 2010, the declaration under Article 34 sub 6 of the Protocol, through which it accepts the jurisdiction of the court to receive cases directly from individuals and non-governmental organizations. On the 21st of November, 2019, the respondent state deposited with the African Union Commission an instrument withdrawing the decla its declaration under Article 34.6 of the protocol. The facts of the matter, the applicant alleges that the respondent state has violated its rights under the Charter by maintaining Article 41 sub 7 in its constitution, which provision bars any court from inquiring into the election of a presidential candidate under the Electoral Commission after the Electoral Commission has declared a winner alleged violations. The applicant avers that by barring courts from inquiring into the election of a presidential candidate after the electoral commission has declared a winner, the respondent state has violated its right to freedom from discrimination under Article 2 of the Charter. The applicant further avers that the respondent state has violated its right to equal protection of the law and the right to have its cause heard, especially the right to appeal to competent national organs against acts violating its fundamental rights as provided for in Articles 
3 2, 3 sub 2, and 7 sub 1 sub A of the charter, respectively. The applicant also alleges that the respondent state has failed to honor its obligation to recognize the rights, duties, and freedoms and enshrined in the charter and to take legislative and other measures to give effect to the charter has stipulated under Article 1 of the charter. It is also the applicant's averment that the respondent state's conduct also violates Article 13 sub 6 sub A of its own constitution. Prayers of the parties. The applicant prays the court for the following. One, the respondent state is in violation of Articles 1, 2, 3 sub 2, and 7 sub 1 of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. Secondly, that the respondent state puts in place constitutional and legislative measures to guarantee the rights provided for under Article 1, 2, 3 sub 2, and 7 sub 1 of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. Thirdly, make an order that the respondent reports to the Honorable Court within a period of 12 months from the date of the judgment issued by the Honorable Court on the implementation of this judgment and consequential orders. Fourthly, any other remedy and or relief that the Honorable Court will deem to grant. And fifthly, the respondent state to pay the applicant's cost. The respondent state in turn praise the court for the following orders with respect to jurisdiction and admissibility. One, that the application has not met the admissibility requirements stipulated under Rule 40 sub 5 of the Rules of Court or Articles 56 sub 5 and Article 6 sub 2 of the Protocol. Secondly, that the application be dismissed in accordance with Rule 38 of the Rules of Court. The respondent state further praised the court for the following orders with respect to merits. One, a declaration that the respondent state is not in violation of Articles 1, 2, 3 sub 2, and 7 sub 1 of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. Secondly, a declaration that Article 41 sub 7 of the respondent state constitution is not in violation of Article 7 sub 1 of the Charter. Hence, no need of making any constitutional and legislative measures to guarantee the rights alleged. Thirdly, that the application be declared inadmissible. Fourthly, that the, that the application be dismissed. Lastly, that the applicant should pay the respondent's cost. On jurisdiction, the court notes with respect to his personal jurisdiction that as earlier stated in, in this judgment, the respondent state is a party to the protocol and on the 29th of March, 2010, filed the declaration prescribed under Article 34.6 of the protocol, accepting the jurisdiction of the court to directly receive applications from individuals and non-governmental organizations with observer status with the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, hereinafter after referred to as the Commission. The court also recalls that the respondent state on the 21st of November, 2019, deposited with the African Union Commission an instrument withdrawing its declaration. As the court has heard, the withdrawal of a declaration deposited pursuant to Article 34.6 of the protocol does not have any retroactive effect. And it also has no bearing on matters pending before, the, before this court prior to the deposit of the declaration, as is the case with the present application. Further, any such withdrawal of a declaration only takes effect 12 months 
after the instrument of withdrawal is deposited and the respondent states withdrawal will therefore take effect on the 21st of November 2020. In light of the foregoing, the court finds that it has personal jurisdiction to examine the present application. With regard to his material jurisdiction, the court has consistently heard that Article 3 sub 1 of the protocol confers on it to the power to examine any application provided it contains allegations of violation of the rights protected by the Charter or any other human rights instrument ratified by the respondent state concerned. Further, the court notes that in accordance with Article 7 of the protocol, it shall apply the provisions of the Charter and any other relevant human rights instrument ratified by the state concerned. In the present matter, the applicant alleges the violation of rights guaranteed in Articles 1, 2, 3 sub 2, and 7 sub 1 sub A of the Charter. As noted above, the respondent state is a party to the Charter and to the Protocol. Consequently, the court finds that its, that its material jurisdiction is established. In relation to temporary jurisdiction, the court holds that the relevant dates in relation to the respondent state are those of entry into force of the Charter and the Protocol, as well as the date of depositing the declaration under Article 34 sub 6 of the Protocol. The court observes that the violations alleged by the applicant stem from Article 41 sub 7 of the respondent state's constitution. The court also observes that this constitution was adopted in 1977, but it has been amended several times over the years. Nevertheless, it is clear that the respondent state constitution was enacted before the respondent state became a party to both the charter and the protocol. Notably, Article 41 sub 7 remains a part of the respondent state laws to date, long after the respondent state became a party to both the charter and the protocol. The court finds, therefore, that the violations alleged by the applicant, though commencing bef before the respondent state became a party to the charter and the protocol, continued after the respondent state became a party to these two instruments. Given the foregoing, the court holds that it has temporary jurisdiction in the present matter. With regard to territorial jurisdiction, the court observed that the alleged violations are all said to have occurred within the territory of the respondent state, and this has not been contested. The court therefore holds that his territorial jurisdiction is established. In light of all the above, the court holds that it has jurisdiction to examine the application filed by the applicants. On admissibility, conditions of admissibility in contention between the parties, the respondent state raises two objections relating first to the requirement of exhaustion of local remedies, and secondly, to the filing of the application within a reasonable time. Objection on the ground that the applicant failed to exhaust local remedies. The respondent state argues that the applicant never made an attempt to exhaust the available local remedies, nor has it given the respondent the opportunity to address his alleged grievances. The right to appeal is also provided under the Constitution of the United Republic of Tanzania together with various enabling statutory provisions. Therefore, it is indeed improper for the applicant at this stage to raise matters which would have been sufficiently addressed within the national jurisdiction, sorry, which could have been sufficiently addressed within the national justice system of the respondent state prior to the application before this honorable court. 
on the basis of the above, au vu dans de ce qui the state argues that the court should find the application déclaré irrecevable. The applicant submits that there is no remedy in the judicial system of the respondent state to address the violations that is alleging. Oh, violation qu'il allait. The court reiterates that in accordance with Article 56 of the Charter, I'm hearing some background noise. Can we take that? Son, en fond sonore. We can hear the interpreter in the channel uh, English. Uh, is the French? Il se pose un problème. Nous entendons l'interprète francophone sur le canal anglais. Est-ce que ce problème peut être résolu? Alfred, please change to English. Switch the English button. Alfred, the, the, I think it's on your side. Have you pressed the... The right, uh, Honorable President, I think it's okay now. Okay. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, is the issue we can have when we are in the, in the techniques in such cases. Thank you. Justice Anu, please, you can proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. We are sorry about that. The applicant submits that there is no remedy within the judicial system of the respondent state to address the violations that he is alleging. The court reiterates that in accordance with Article 56.5 of the Charter and Rule 40 sub 5 of the rules, for an application to be admissible, it must be filed after exhausting local remedies, if any unless it is obvious to the court that this procedure is unduly prolonged. The court records that for purposes of exhausting local remedies, an applicant is only required to exhaust judicial remedies that are available, effective, and sufficient. As confirmed by both the commission and the court, a remedy is, avail is available if it can be utilized as a matter of fact, without impediment. A remedy is effective if it offers a real prospect of success. And a remedy is sufficient if it is capable of re redressing the wrong complained against. However, the court has always considered that there is an exception to this rule if local remedies are unavailable ineffective or insufficient, or if the procedure for obtaining such remedies is abnormally prolonged. The court also notes that an applicant is only required to exhaust ordinary judicial remedies. The court recalls that in ordinary language, being effective refers to that which produces the expected results. The effectiveness of a remedy is therefore measured in terms of its ability to solve the problem raised by the applicant. The court further records that a remedy is available if it can be pursued by the applicant without any impediment. The court notes that in 1995, the respondent state enacted the Basic Rights and Duties Enforcement Act which permits litigants to, infor to en enforce the basic rights and duties set out in Chapter 1, Part 3 of his Constitution. Under this Act, the High Court has the power to make all such orders as shall be necessary and appropriate to secure the enjoyment of the basic rights, freedom, and duties of an applicant. In considering the powers of the High Court under the Basic Rights and Duties Enforcement Act, the court takes judicial notice of the fact that the respondent state's court of appeal in Attorney General versus Metikila held that it did not have the power to nullify any constitutional provisions. Specifically, in respect of Article 41 sub 7 of the respondent state's constitution, the court also takes judicial notice of the decision of the respondent state's high court in Augustine 
Lautoga Rema versus Attorney General, in which it heard that at the 41 sub 7 in unambiguous language has ousted the jurisdiction of courts to inquire into the election of the president once the electoral commission has declared the results. According to the High Court, if Parliament had intended for courts to have the power to inquire into the election of a president, clear provision for the same would have been included in the Constitution. In the present circumstances, the court notes that had the applicant challenged Article 41 sub 7 before the respondent state court, the application would have inevitably been dismissed on the basis that no court in the respondent state has the power to nullify provisions of its constitution. In this regard, the court further notes that a domestic remedy that has no prospects of sources does not constitute an effective remedy within the context of Article 56 sub 5 of the Charter. In the circumstances, therefore, the court finds that the applicant did not have a remedy that was available for exhaustion before filing this application. In light of the above, the court dismisses the respondent state objection to the admissibility of the application on the ground that domestic remedies were not exhausted. Objection on the ground that the application was not filed within a reasonable time. The respondent state argues that the application does not meet the requirement of Rule 40 sub 6 of the court rules. According to the respondent state, and I quote, the applicant's case at the local jurisdiction was concluded in 2010, where, where the Court of Appeal of Tanzania dismissed the appeal. It has taken eight years for the applicant to file his application in this honorable court. Quotation closes. Although the respondent state concedes that neither the charter nor the rules prescribe a time limit within which an individual is required to file an application, it submits that the application, and I quote, does not fulfill the provisions of Article 56.6 of the African Charter together with, rule, together with Rule 46 of the court rules. Thus, it should be rejected by the court. Quotation closes. The applicant submits that there is no time frame stipulated under Article 56.6 of the Charter and that it fails on the it falls on the court. It falls on the court. Sorry, to pronounce itself on what, in his view, is within a reasonable time. The court confirms that Article Fifty Six of Six of the Charter does not stipulate a precise time limit within which an application shall be filed before the court. Rule Forty Sub Six of the Rules simply refers to a reasonable time from the date local remedies were exhausted or from the date set by the court as being the commencement of the time limit within which it shall be seized of the matter. As the court has established, the reasonableness of the period for seizure of the court depends on the particular circumstances of each case and must be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. In the present application, the court takes cognizance of the fact that the source of the violation alleged by the applicant lies in the provision of the respondent state constitution. The court also recalls that the respondent state deposited the declaration under Article 34 sub 6 of the protocol in March 2010. Strictly speaking, therefore, the door for commencing action against the respondent state in relation to the violations alleged by the applicant was only opened in March 2010. This application, however, was filed on the 4th of July 2018, which is eight years and four months after the deposit of the declaration. In the circumstances, the court must determine whether on the facts of the present case, the aforementioned period is reasonable within the meaning of Rule 46 of the rules. 
The court recalls that Rule 46 of the rules, which restates, which restates Article 566 of the Charter, emphasizes two aspects that the court must consider for purposes of de determining whether or not an application fulfills the requirement of being filed within a reasonable time. The first aspect is that an application be filed within a reasonable time from the date local remedies were exhausted. The second aspect requires that an application be filed within a reasonable time from the date set by the court as being the commencement of the time limit within which it shall be seized with the matter. In the present application, since the court has found that there were no domestic judicial remedies available for the applicant to exhaust, the question of a reasonable time after the exhaustion of domestic remedies within which the applicant ought to have filed his application with the court does not arise. The court therefore holds that this application fulfills the requirement in the first limb of Rule 40, sub 6 of the Rules of Court. As for the second aspect of Rule 46, the court recalls that the date from which an application can be filed against any state party is from the date on which that particular state deposited the declaration under Article 34 sub 6 of the protocol, which for the respondent state is 29th March 2010. In the present application, however, the court notes that the applicant alleges continuing violation of his rights, and the court has found for purposes of establishing temporal jurisdiction that the alleged violations have a continuous character since they are founded in a law adopted in 1977, which remains in force to date. The court notes that in this case, it took the applicant eight years and four months to file his case from the time when the respondent state deposited his declaration. However, no local remedy was available for the applicant to exhaust, and the persistence of violations meant that they automatically renewed themselves. Given this context, the court holds that on the facts of the present case and within the meaning of the second lane of Rule 40 sub 6, it could have ceased of the matter any time for as long as the law causing the alleged violation remained in force. In light of the above, the court therefore holds that the application meets the requirement in Rule 40 sub 6 of the rules and thus dismisses the respondent state's objection. Other conditions of admissibility. The court knows from the record that the applicant's compliance with the requirements in Article 56 sub Articles 1, 2, 3, 4, and 7 of the Charter, which requirements are reinstated in sub-rules 1, 2, 3, 4, and 7 of rules 40 of the rules, is not in contention between the parties. As a consequence of the foregoing, the court finds that the application fulfills all admissibility requirements set out under Article 56 of the Charter as reinstated in, a, in Rule 40 of the Rules and accordingly declares it admissible. Merits. We will now consider the merits of this case. The application alleges violation of Articles 1, 2, 3, 2, and 7 sub 1a of the Charter. Alleged violation of the right to non-discrimination. The court recalls that Article 2 of the Charter provides as follows, and I quote, every individual shall be entitled to the enjoyment of the rights and freedoms recognized and guaranteed in the present Charter without distinction of any kind, such as race, ethnic group, color, sex, language, religion, political, or any other opinion, national and social origin, fortune, birth, or any status, quotation closes. The court recalls that in APDH versus Côte d'Ivoire, 
It accepted that discrimination is a differentiation of persons or situations on the basis of one or several unlawful criterion or criteria. The understanding of discrimination, however, is what is often referred to as direct discrimination. In cases where the discrimination is indirect, the key indicator is not necessarily different treatment based on visible or unlawful criteria, but the disparate effect on groups or individuals as a result of specified measures or action. While direct discrimination may be more prominent in human rights discourse, international human rights law prohibits both direct and indirect discrimination. The court notes that while the Charter is unequivocal in his prescription of discrimination, not all forms of distinction or differentiation can be considered as discrimination. A, dis a distinction or differential treatment becomes discrimination contrary to Article 2 when it does not have any objective and reasonable justification and in circumstances where it is not necessary and proportional. The court observed that the respondent state in its submission has not denied the possible distinction affected by Article 41 sub 7 of its constitution, mm -hmm. but it argued that the same is justifiable since there is a reasonable relationship of proportionality be between the means adopted and the results sought to be achieved, which is the protection of the United Republic of Tanzania's sovereignty. The respondent state has not invoked the doctrine. I take that again. The respondent state also invoked the doctrine of margin of appreciation as justifying the measures that it has devised through Article 41 sub 7 of its constitution. The court notes, however, that Article 41 sub 7 of the respondent state's constitution creates a differentiation between litigants in that while the respondent state courts are permitted to look into any allegation by any litigant, they are not given equal latitude when a litigant seeks to inquire into the election of a president. The result is that those seeking to inquire into the election of a president are practically treated differently from other litigants, especially by being denied access to judicial remedies, while litigants with other claims are not similarly barred. The court emphasizes that while Article 41 sub 7 of the respondent state constitution is seemingly neutral on its face, and that it, in principle, applies to all citizens within the respondent state, this provision does not have the same effect on all citizens. It is right that in a multi-party multi democracy like the respondent state, during any election, the electorate would vote for different candidates. In this sense, therefore, there would be within the broad group of voters, different subgroups depending on their political persuasion. Why those supporting winning candidates may not have the motivation to approach the courts for relief in relation to the electoral process, the other subgroups of voters may be desirous of seeking judicial intervention to enforce their rights. By outrightly barring the courts from considering a complaint by anyone in relation to the results of a presidential election, in effect, Article 41 sub 7 of the respondent state constitution treats citizens that may wish to judicially challenge the election of a president differently and less favorably as compared to citizens with grievances other than those related to the election of a president. In the absence of clear justification as to how the differentiation and distinction in Article 41 sub 7 is necessary and reasonable in a democratic society, the court finds that Article 41 sub 7 of the respondent state's constitution effects a distinction 
a distinction, I take that again, between litigants and that this distinction has no justification under the charter. This distinction is such that individuals within the respondent state are excluded from pursuing a remedy before the court simply because of the subject matter of their grievances, while other individuals with grievances not related to the election of a president are not equally bad. In the circumstances, the court holds that Article 41 sub 7 of the Respondent State Constitution violates the applicant's right to be free from discrimination as guaranteed under Article 2 of the Charter on alleged violation of the right to equal protection of the law. The court holds that Article 32 Article 3 sub 2 of the Charter provides that every individual shall be entitled to equal protection of the law. The court notes that the principle of equality before the law, which is implicit in the principle of equal protection of the law and equality before the law, does not necessarily require equal treatment in all instances and may allow differentiated treatment of individuals placed in different situations. At the same time, however, equal protection of the law presupposes that the law protects everyone without discrimination. In the present case, the court knows that Article 41.7 of the Respondent State Constitution does not deny the applicant equal protection of the laws in the respondent states. The applicant, like other citizens, has been guaranteed the same range of rights in respect of contesting the election of a president. Given these circumstances, the court finds that the applicant has failed to prove a violation of Article 3 sub 2 of the Charter. In the circumstances, the court holds that Article 41.7 of the respondent state constitution does not violate the applicant's right to equal protection of the law guaranteed under Article 3 sub 2 of the Charter. On alleged violation of the applicant's right to have his cause heard, the applicant avers that by having Article 41 sub 7 as a part of the Constitution, the respondent state has violated his right under Article 7 sub 1 sub A of the Charter. The court observed that the right to have one's cause heard as enshrined under Article 71A of the Charter bestows upon individuals a wide range of entitlements pertaining to due process of the law, of law, including the right to be given an opportunity to express their views on matters and procedures affecting their rights. The right to file a petition before appropriate judicial and quasi-judicial authorities for violations of these rights and the right to appeal to higher judicial authorities when their grievances are not properly addressed by the lower court. The court also notes that the right to have one cause heard does not cease to exist after the completion of appellate proceedings. In circumstances where there are cogent reasons to believe that the findings of the trial or appellate courts are no longer valid, the right to be heard requires that a mechanism to review such findings should be put in place. The court records that among the key elements of the right to a fair hearing, as guaranteed under Article 7 of the Charter, is the right of access to a court for adjudication of one's grievances and the right to appeal against any decision rendered in the process. As against this, the court notes that Article 41 sub 7 of the Respondent State Constitution has outside the jurisdiction of courts to consider any complaints in relation to the election of a presidential candidate after the Electoral Commission has declared a winner. This entails that irrespective of the nature of the grievance or the merit thereof, as long as the same pertains to the declaration by the Electoral Commission of the winner of a presidential election, no remedy by way of a judicial challenge exists to any aggrieved person 
within the respondent state. Focusing on the position of the respondent state in this application, especially in relation to the purported restriction of the right to have one cause heard, the court notes that there's nothing in the submission of the respondent state which establishes any of the conditions in Article 27 sub 2 of the Charter to justify a limitation of the right to have one cause heard. Admittedly, there is a constitutional provision, Article 40, 41 sub 7 of the Respondent State Constitution, which prescribes the limitation at, at issue here. However, it is strike law that a state cannot invoke its domestic laws to justify a breach of its international obligations. Resultantly, therefore, if a state relies on the provision of a domestic law to justify restriction of a right, such a state must be able to demonstrate that the provisions in his domestic law do not infringe the charter. In the circumstances, the court holds that Article 41 sub 7 of the Respondent State Constitution, in so far as it housed the jurisdiction of courts to consider challenges to a presidential election after the Electoral Commission has declared a winner, violates Article 7 sub 1 sub A of the Charter. On the alleged violation of Article 1 of the Charter, the court considered that, as it has heard in its earlier judgment, examining an alleged violation of Article 1 of the Charter involves a determination not only of whether the measures adopted by the re respondent state are available, but also if these measures were implemented in order to achieve the intended object and purpose of the Charter. Consequently, whenever a substantive right of the Charter is violated due to the respondent state failure to meet, this, to meet these obligations, Article 1 will be, will be found to have been violated. In the present case, the court has found that the respondent state has violated Articles 2 and Article 7 sub 1 sub A of the Charter. Resultantly, the court holds that the respondent state has also violated Article 1 of the Charter. Reparations. Article 27 1 of the Protocol provides that if the court finds that there has been a violation of a human or people's rights, it shall make appropriate orders to remedy the violation, including the payment of fair compensation or reparation. Measures that a state can take to remedy a violation of human rights include restitution, compensation, and rehabilitation of the victim, as well as measures to ensure non-repetition of the violations, taking into account the circumstances of each case. It is against the above enumerated principles that the court will consider the claim for reparations by the applicant. Adoption of constitutional and legislative measures. The court having found that Article 41 sub 7 of the Respondent State Constitution violates Article 1, 2, and at Article 7 sub 1 sub A of the Charter, orders the Respondent State to take all necessary constitutional and legislative measures within a reasonable time to ensure that Article 41 sub 7 of its constitution is amended and aligned with the provisions of the Charter so as to eliminate, amongst others, any violations of Article 2 and Article 7 sub 1 sub A of the Charter. The respondent state is also ordered to report to the court within 12 months of this judgment on the measures taken to implement the terms of the judgment. Other measures of reparation. The court recalls that Article 27.1 of the protocol gives it power to make appropriate orders to remedy violations. In the circumstances, the court reaffirms that it can by way of reparation, other publication of his decision so motu, where the circumstances of the case so require. In the present case, the court notes that the violation that it has established 
affects a significant section of the population in the respondent state by reason of the fact that they relate to the exercise of several rights in the Charter, key among which is the right to political participation guaranteed under Article 13 of the Charter. In the circumstances, the court deems it proper to make an order so motto for publication of this judgment. The court therefore orders the respondent state to publish this judgment within a period of three months from the date of notification on the website of the judiciary and the Ministry for Constitutional and Legal Affairs and to ensure that the text of the judgment remains accessible for at least one year after the date of publication. The operative part of the judgment. For this reason, the court on jurisdiction unanimously holds that it has jurisdiction. On admissibility, by a majority of seven four and three against, just, Justice Tujile Chizomila, Blaise Chikaya, and Stella Anukam dissenting, dismisses the objection to admissibility of the application and declares the application admissible. On merits, by a majority of 6-4 and 4 against, Judge, Judge Sylvia Ore, Susan Menge, Tijalen Chizomila, and Blaise Chikaya pose that Article 41, sub-7 of the Respondent State Constitution, insofar as it bars court from inquiring into the election of a presidential candidate who has been declared elected by the Electoral Commission violates Article 2 of the Charter. By the President casting votes under Rule, 4, six, under rule 64 of the Rules, with 5-4, Justice Ben Kiyoko, Rafa Ben Ashu, Ajelo Matuse, Shafika Ben Saula, and Marie Therese Mukamolisa, and five against, Judge Sylvia Ore, Susan Menge, Tijalin Chizomila, Blaise Shikaya, and Stella Anukam, holds that Article 41 7 of the Respondent State Constitution does not violate Article 3 sub 2 of the Charter. By a majority of 9, 4, and 1 against, Judge Blaise Shikaya dissenting, holds that Article 41 sub 7 of the Respondent State Constitution, insofar as it bars courts from inquiring into the election of a presidential candidate who has been declared elected by the Electoral Commission, violates Article 7 sub 1 sub A of the Charter. By a majority of 9-4 and 1 against, Judge Blaise Shikaya dissenting, holds that by retaining Article 41 sub 7 of his constitution, the respondent state has violated Article 1 of the Charter. On reparations, orders the respondent state to take all necessary constitutional and legislative measures within a reasonable time, and in any case, not exceeding two years, to ensure that Article 41 sub 7 of his constitution is amended and aligned with the provisions of the Charter to eliminate, amongst others, a violation of Articles 2 and Article 7 sub 1a of the Charter. Others, the respondent states to publish this judgment on the website of his judiciary and the Ministry for Constitutional and Legal Affairs within a period of three months from the date of notification of this judgment and for at least one year after the date of publication. On implementation of the judgment and reporting, orders the respondent state to report to the court within 12 months of notification of this judgment on the measures taken to implement the terms of the judgment and thereafter every six months until the court considers that there has been full implementation thereof. On cost, others that each party shall bear his cost. 
This judgment is signed by the same bench as earlier mentioned at the beginning of this reading. In accordance with Article 28.7 of the Protocol and Rule 65 of the Rules, however, the dissenting opinion of Justice Blair Shikaya and the joint separate opinion of Justice of Judges Ben Kiyoko and Angelo Matsuse are appended to this judgment. Done at Arusha, this 15th day of July in the year 2020, in English and French, the English text being author authoritative. This is the judgment of the court. Thank you. Uh, the court uh, will now suspend and resume in uh, five minutes for the bench to be reconstituted uh, in the matter of Sibi uh, Gori versus Côte d'Ivoire. Yes, sir. thank you, Mr. President. The, the, Your microphone, please. Yes. The court will resume in uh, five minutes, say at uh, 12 30, to consider to deliver judgment in the matter of Subi Gore against Cote d'Ivoire. Court okay. is adjourned. Okay, so 12 30, uh, meaning 9 30. GMT. Thank you very much. GMT. No, East African time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah.